Uh, good day, everyone. I'm Alice um, Jinglen from the Department of Education and Information Technology at East China Normal University. Um, today, I'm the host of uh, the online discussion with the Dean of Education and Human Development, Vanderbilt University, Professor Kaminia Bembo. And we also invite two young scholars from Seoul National University, Data Kimani and Ms. Mihim Kim. Uh, and um, today's arrangement is like this. We all have a Professor Bembo to talk about like 20 minutes um, on the talk of dancing with AI, a very promising um, technology and um, talking every day now, he here and now. And um, then we will have 30 minutes um, to have the two discussants asking questions and about this topic. I think the reason why I took this job is partly because my research interest is centered on using GPT to foster critical thinking and argumentative writing. Uh, I'm also uh, currently working on a two-year international project uh, studying since last year, September, with research teams from Peking University and Monash University, and the mo uh, main focus of which is to using ChatGPT to empower intelligent assessment of critical thinking. So I'd also want um, the chance to talk with you guys. And without further ado, I would like to invite Professor Bembo to start share and um, her insights on the topic, dancing with AI, navigating new literacies and challenges in education. The time is yours, Professor Bembo. Can you open the mic, Bimbo? Sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry about that. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. And I think I'm going to be posing a lot more questions than in, and informing you. And, and I'm sure you know more about AI than I do, but I hope we can have a wonderful conversation. But let me begin by thanking the Global Education Dean's Forum for organizing this series of conversations. As institutional leaders, we are all hard pressed to keep up with everything happening in our field. And this has become even more challenging with the rapid globalization of education. Thankfully, institutions like ECNU have undertaken to bring us all together to reflect on the challenges that we share. So let me begin by thanking the ECNU faculty for organizing this event. But I'd like to start by sharing a little bit about my own background as a means of describing my general approach to educational questions. I began my graduate studies many years ago with Julian Stanley at Johns Hopkins University. Julian was a pioneer in intelligence research who made a reputation for his work with early adolescents and adolescent children, whom he identified as being precocious or advanced for their age. Using the Scholastic Aptitude Test, the SAT, Julian identified students with unusually high levels of mathematical or verbal talent, even when taking the test several years before the typical age. And much of what we think of as gifted education today grows directly from the research done by Julian Stanley. Julian and his team, which I was pleased to be part of, would work directly with those gifted students to cultivate the talent they already exhibited through enrichment, accelerated learning, and other techniques our goal was to activate their potential while monitoring their academic and other successes over time. To make a long story short, I became the director and then the co-director of the study of mathematical precocious youth, which has now followed some 5,000 highly talented individuals for more than 50 years. I share this to illustrate that whether as a researcher or as a college dean, 
I have always approached educational questions through the lens of talent identification and talent development. I have a deep belief that the key to educational success is to identify what people are good at and then to match their talents with the resources needed to help them optimize their full potential. At Peabody College of Education and Human Development, we speak of our mission broadly as helping people thrive. Which brings us to today's conversation. We all understand how rapidly education is changing and how profoundly. And this underlies the importance of being able to answer the question of what constitutes human thriving. The most obvious current example of something threatening disruption is AI, artificial intelligence. At my institution, we've been struggling to identify and answer a range of questions having to do with the latest technological revolution. Some of these questions are basic. What are large language models and how do they work? Other questions have to do with application. What are the potential uses of this new technology, especially in educational context? Still other questions are ethical. Is it right for students to make use of this technology in their courses? Under what circumstances? Is it appropriate for our own faculty to use it in the conduct of their teaching and research? When and how should AI use be acknowledged? To be clear, I'm not pretending to have the answers to any of these questions. For many of us, AI feels like a black box that we somehow found ourselves inside of. We are all feeling our way along in the dark of this unfamiliar terrain. Caution in the use of these new tools is warranted. At the same time, we cannot afford to be too cautious because the same technology that I myself find sort of intimidating as a senior scholar is like a shiny new sports car to those we teach or mentor. Now, AI caught us fully unprepared when ChatGPT launched last year, but we cannot afford to remain ignorant. Our students in higher education, in secondary, and soon in elementary education are already exploring the new capabilities that industry has handed them. As educators of educators, we must integrate AI tools consciously in our curricula as we prepare the workforce of the future. Our graduates should be developing facility not only with using AI in their studies, but in applying capabilities to develop lesson plans, teach content, assess learning, and measure achievement. Vanderbilt has decided to fully embrace AI, both as a tool for learning, as well as an object of study. Last month, Vanderbilt announced that it will establish its first new school or college in more than 40 years, the College of Connected Computing. Vanderbilt's goal is to unite the university efforts in computer science, AI, data science, and related fields within this new college. Now, many within Vanderbilt are not waiting for this new college. As Vanderbilt's College of Education, Peabody has launched a strategic initiative aimed at deepening our understanding of how to apply data science, AI, and other new technologies to critical questions in teaching and learning. 
Our new live initiative is devoted to thinking differently about technology's role in teaching and learning in both formal and informal settings. Our live initiative is led by Professor Alyssa Weiss. We recruited her this academic year from New York University. Professor Weiss combines knowledge of the learning sciences with the specialized tools of data science to perform sophisticated learning analytics. Using natural language processing, social network analysis, and predictive modeling techniques, Professor Weiss has conducted mixed method investigations to study how educational practices are being reshaped by these new tools. One aspect that I would like to emphasize about her work and the potential for innovation in this space is to bring greater attention to equity. Better tools and better questions can lead to better outcomes for students, especially those who have often been marginalized. Professor Weiss puts human-centered design principles at the heart of her work. Another way Peabody College is learning to dance with technology is in our own curricular offerings. As you are all aware, the higher education market is undergoing rapid transformation. We are coming to grips with the reality that today's professional learners are not necessarily seeking degrees. They are seeking skills, often through alternative means of credentialing. And the same is true in reverse. Many of our master's degree students in traditional disciplines have related interests in acquiring knowledge or skills that will give them an edge in the job market upon graduation. In response to this growing demand, this academic year, we devised five new certificates that students can add to their degrees through careful use of elective credits. Beginning this fall, students will be able to add a certificate in one of the following areas, dyslexia studies, early childhood policy, emerging learning technologies and AI, learning analytics, and pediatric psychosocial care. Each certificate consists of 12 credit hours. They are designed to complement existing degrees, but also to cut across disciplines and departments to open up advanced study in areas with strong career or salary prospects. Now, some of what I've said so far is intended to suggest just how different our educational landscape has become in only a few years. And much of this change is positive. As I indicated, data science can be a driver for educational equity. Learning analytics can help us measure the effectiveness of teaching or identify areas needing greater attention. Clearly, these powerful tools are assets for teachers educational leaders and policymakers because they have the potential to advance student achievement. Even so, most classroom teachers go into teaching never having taken a computer science course. Our educational moment demands an unprecedented level of digital literacy. And as teachers of teachers, we must respond. And just as AI represents both a problem to be solved, as well as an opportunity to radically elevate teaching, there are other unfolding challenges that demand a response from educators. The children in our care today are growing up in a time of widening economic inequality, as well as deep social anxiety, not to mention political division. It is appropriate that we ask ourselves what other types of knowledge or forms of liter literacy are required for citizenship and full participation in contemporary society. 
Permit me to suggest several avenues for investigation. With climate change now affecting large populations, are we teaching science in a manner that is ad adequate to the scale and nature of the climate crisis? What scientific knowledge will 21st century citizens need to understand the causes and effects of climate change and to adapt their policies and behaviors? Are education schools preparing teachers who can adequately convey these understandings? Given the accelerated pace of technological change, what is the right mix of theoretical knowledge, applied knowledge, and practical skills required to ensure economic and material well being? Does the curriculum as it exists serve students' needs, given the threat that automation poses for job disruption? How should it be revised or remedied? Numeracy confers benefits in a highly technical society. Less clear, however, is whether a mathematics instruction, at least here in the US, actually confers numeracy. Does the mathematics curriculum do a sufficient job of instilling conceptual knowledge, developing problem-solving skills, or preparing students for applied mathematical reasoning? What is the necessary level of knowledge for someone to be considered computer literate? Mastery of data science involves knowledge of statistics and probability, algebra and calculus, software programming and domain knowledge, not to mention analytical skill. But what level of general knowledge is necessary for someone to be considered well-informed? Does literacy as traditionally understood confer sufficient ability to communicate and maneuver as a responsible person? Or does the ubiquity of visual media dictate new definitions of literacy that should include the ability to understand and communicate information using graphics, charts, photographs, and videos. Are there other types of new literacies education schools must also raise to comprehend and incorporate in our teaching and research? If we fail to address these questions, the widening skills gap we are already observing increases the likelihood that many learners will be left behind economically, as well as exposed and vulnerable to harmful beliefs, ideologies, and conspiracies. Let me briefly share in that regard a new program that Vanderbilt is launching in 2025. It will be called the Alexander Initiative after the former Senator and U.S. Education Secretary Lamar Alexander. The initiative will recruit highly qualified history, civics, social studies teachers from across the country to participate in a year-long seminar designed to help them teach controversial subjects and encourage civil discourse. The old Horace Mann schools work to educate students in preparation for democratic participation. Through the Alexander Initiative, we hope to prepare history and social studies teachers who can help students avoid tribalism, navigate political polarization, think critically, and argue constructively. For those concerned with the youngest learners, we know that early childhood development is the foundation of well being. And we also are developing a new strategic initiative in this area. As a college, Peabody has many faculty conducting research across five departments on topics in child development, developmental delays, language intervention, cognition, and early learning, among others. By fostering greater collaboration across our faculty, and by developing partnerships with social service organizations in the community, we hope to ensure that young children will begin their schooling physically and cognitively ready to learn, 
and that whatever gains have been made through early intervention will not be lost. Better preparation for schooling unlocks potential and leveling the playing field for people of different socioeconomic backgrounds is key to ensuring healthy societies with full participation. A similar desire lies behind Peabody's global engagement strategy. More than a decade ago, the college entered a collaboration with the Emirate of Abu Dhabi to strengthen early childhood, elementary, and STEM education, as well as principal professional development. That partnership launched two demonstration schools, one elementary and one pre-K. This year, we are returning to the United Arab Emirates to launch the Emirates' first education doctorate online. Peabody faculty also have been helping establish a new college of education at the American University of Iraq, Baghdad. The school accepted its first cohort of aspiring teachers this semester. We also are working to establish teacher professional development and principal leadership training programs in Jordan. Every year, we host a cohort of Hubert Humphrey Fellows through the Fulbright Exchange Program from across the globe. More than a dozen international leaders spend an academic year taking graduate level courses, meeting with US peers and developing plans to strengthen their home educational system upon their return. Peabody's Humphreys program is now in its 15 year. We see partnerships like these as integral to the future of education and we invite more. As forums such as this demonstrate, our responses to educational challenges will be made stronger through conversation, cooperation, and collaboration with our international peers. I hope it's clear that I'm still optimistic about the power of education despite current challenges. I know from my own research that, are all, that there are always pools of untapped talent waiting to be discovered and developed. And I'm excited about the potential that technology holds to reduce barriers between people, nations, and global regions. With the world more at our fingertips than ever before, it is still possible for a teacher to spark a sense of wonder, curiosity about the unfamiliar, and a desire to explore. With cultivation, that desire can become a lifelong vocation. The question for all of us as educators is how can we take advantage of these amazing new capabilities to personalize learning so that we can better meet the needs and potentials of all individuals? While I may not have all the answers to those questions or very few, I know that the students here in the classes and you, the faculty at ESNU, ECNU and other in Korea and in other areas, I know that they will have many contributions that they can contribute uh, to helping us move forward in this way. And so with that, I thank you for giving me time to present some of the challenges that I as a senior dean, I've been a dean for 26 years, as I see facing the profession, they're not challenges, but they are really opportunities. And I hope the students who are listening to this talk will see this as opportunities and help lead us forward. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, Professor Bimbo's uh, thought-provoking talk. I think you, what you've shared is far more um, too much for this um, talk, like your title is Dancing with AI, but you shared the stories of your graduate um, research and also talking about some um, popular topics like what are LLM and how to adopt them in um, educational context and you extend to some I think uh, the need for educators and schools to adapt and em embrace the new technologies 
and how to personalize them. And I think our audience and especially our two discussants are eager to have this chance to talk with you and uh, ask you some questions. I think they're ready. Okay, Professor Lee, <laughs> you can start. Can you hear me? Can you hear me all right? Yes. Oh, great. Um, so my students can prepare their questions as well. I didn't warn them before, but anyway. Um, so thank you so much, um, Professor um, Benda, Bembo. Uh, you know, um, you posed so many questions that my head is going crazy right now, rather than having any clear question back to you. Uh, but first thing to ask is that you have served as the Dean for 26 years, as you mentioned. And uh, here, even at SNU and everywhere around the world, AI seems to be like most disruptive uh, things happen. Everyone is getting really panicked. So the first question, personally, I'm just wondering how crazy this is for you, according to, to 26 years. I'm pretty sure you have many crises because education has always crises happening. So how big is it? Is it the most disruptive crisis that you have experienced for 24, uh, 26 years that uh, while you're serving as a dean? You know what? I think I think this change is the biggest change that we are dealing with. Uh, and I don't think I don't think people know what to do with it yet. And I think it has enormous power to be helpful, enormous power to enhance learning, to level the playing fields. But the power of the the power itself is a little scary. So yes, I've seen a lot of changes. You know, I, I got my uh, I got my doctorate in 1981, so I've been in in this profession now for over 40 years. And I think in terms of disruptors, this is the biggest disruptor. It's going to change how we work, how we learn, uh, and but it and for somebody who is more senior like me. Uh, I have to admit that, you know, I get anxious thinking about it, but I think students, the young students, think of it as a, as a challenge, and I think they're intrigued, and I think they want to grab hold of it. So I think the positive changes are going to come from our students, uh, and I and I have faith in them. Thank you so much. Um, I do have a couple more questions. Is it okay to keep going or do you want? All right, great. Um, so uh, one of the things that I'm most interested in is this idea of personalized learning powered by AI. And I'll tell the truth, I don't really trust that. <laughs> so I don't think that div divide that we have right now in our society, inequality problem is not that simple. That giving just tool, whether it's like AI tool or not, is not gonna solve those students in need or who are not prepared for study is gonna study. Um, so uh, you just mentioned the education and equity as well yourself. So I'm really wondering what your view is on the possibility of AI in terms of giving the, not necessarily about learning, but giving the equal opportunity to the students who are in the situation which may not be pro learning or teaching or any pedagogical activities. Um, do you think that the AI can do more than just helping them to learn um, beyond beyond learning? And is there anything that AI can help them to get out of the situation, be actually be able to engage in the educational practice that we are trying to plan to give them? Well, um, you know, at, at Vanderbilt, one of our strengths in education is special education. And that's, uh, you know, special education works with students who have learning challenges, or as some people say, learning differences. These are individuals who may have trouble learning how to read, or they may have trouble with mathematics, or they may have other learning disabilities. We have always, for decades, tried to intervene and provide interventions that personalize the learning for those students. That's what special education does. It adjusts the curriculum and adjusts the way we teach 
so that those students who have learning challenges also can learn. Similarly, I talked about that, you know, my work has always been with gifted students and particularly mathematically gifted and advanced students. Well, when you, those students that I have worked with over the years, many times are sitting in classrooms where they have already mastered the materials in the classroom. They already know the materials that the teacher is trying to teach them. And they get bored. And so while they may not have a trouble, they don't, may not have a learning challenge, they have a different learning. They actually have a learning challenge or a different one. And that is that they're sitting in an environment that doesn't match where they are developmentally. And because of that, because they're bored or they're not learning anything new every day, again, it becomes a learning problem. And this is where I think AI comes in. For those advanced students who already have mastered the curriculum in a class, AI might be able to provide interventions and challenges that goes beyond the regular curriculum. It may challenge them and it would help the teacher you know, being able to personalize the learning because the AI could could tailor it to that individual student. And so whether this, when a student, and this is my point, students learn at different rates. They come to us at different places in the curriculum. We have always tried to respond to that, but our tools have been rather limited and what I think here is with AI is that's going to allow our teachers to become more effective. It's not that AI is going to replace the teacher, but now instead of the teacher with, say, 25 students in the classroom, using AI can, can tailor the learning experiences to what the needs are of the students. And in gifted education, we have always talked about the optimal match. What you want to do when you're a teacher is to present materials to your students that is slightly, just a little bit above where they are right now. Not too far above because then you're it's out of reach of them and certainly not below because then you're not learning. And it's the right, the, the, the challenge of a teacher is to find out where are they students and then to provide learning experiences that matches where that student is in the curriculum. And I think that's where the power of AI can come in and help the teacher do a much better job of tailoring the learning experiences that they provide to their students in a much more nuanced and fine way. And I think many of us talk about teachers becoming much more of guides on the side or coaches, the AI will help them do that. Instead of lecturing and providing the same material to all 25 students in your classroom, irrespective of where their student is and how fast they're learning, AI can make it be more responsive to the individual students in the class. So I see it as a tool that will help our teachers be even more effective with our students, deliver even better teaching and curricula, and really help level the playing field because it will allow all students to be learning. And, and also teachers differ in their capacities and AI can sometimes compensate for that. Thank you so much. Um... I totally agree with you with the talented students. I think probably concern in this class is not really about those students who are already advanced, who needs more advanced mat materials. I have to show you this. This is our textbook that we're reading right now. It's uh, Paul Willis learning to deliver, you know, what's going on in this book. So the concern that we have in this class is uh, how we can help actually the working class kids get out of their you know, ongoing poverty and their lifelong journey to the, the same like working class uh, regime. So having said that, I think my students will probably 
kind of want to push you further, a little bit further, go the other direction, not from you know, moving from talent to students, but if you want to say something, um, just like as you did uh, about talented students elegantly about this students in working class conditions that who are not anyway engaged with the learning, how we can help with AI for those students who, you know, so, you know, the question is pretty open, but I want you to hear your voices on that matter as well. Thank you. Well, I, I think there are different ways of, of, present, of answering that question. First of all, there are a lot of gifted students in working class from into working classes. So, <laughs> so I don't think we should assume that all students from the working classes aren't gifted. And as a matter of fact, often gifted students from the working classes are overlooked. And I think that AI could better identify those students from the working classes and for lower SES socioeconomic backgrounds and challenge them. And as a person who works with gifted students, it's always the most rewarding to help a student who comes from a background that isn't rich in, or that isn't privileged and give them opportunities so that they can thrive. Uh, and so this is where schools often come in. But unfortunately, at least in the United States, students who come from working class backgrounds and live in areas like those often are not given the best teachers. And, and so here, where, where you live determines what school you go to. And those children who go to schools where the parents are more privileged, where the parents have more economic income, those schools tend to be much better schools than the schools who come from lower SES backgrounds. Now, where I think is that AI can, so basically the best teachers tend to go to the schools where the more privileged students are, where I think AI can, can make a difference is that those teachers who go maybe into the working class schools, it can help them be even better because it, can maybe make up for things that they don't know and can develop things. So to me, what AI is a tool that can perhaps help teachers who for whatever reasons are not as effective as other teachers become more effective. Teachers who can as, as you know inspire, who are highly educated, who are curious and have a wealth of knowledge and teaching strategies may not benefit as much from AI as a teacher who doesn't have those skills. So I think AI will level the playing field. The other thing is too, um, you know, where special education comes in and kids will learn how to read, it's not, you know, that is something also that helps give, you know, helps them surge ahead. So I think AI can help children who are struggling to learn and again, level the playing field. So yes, I use the examples of gifted education of how we try to personalize learning because it was an easy example and it's one that I work with myself, but the principle is the same, regardless of whether you're gifted or not. We all differ in where we are, what we know, how fast we learn and AI can a compensate for those differences and move people along and accelerate their learning. So I, I think AI can be a leveler uh, if used appropriately. And what we have to guard against and make sure is that that not all the AI, that the AI tools become equally distributed across all our schools that we have. And I think that might be a concern. Oh, thank you so much. And my apology for assuming who gifted students are. That was bad, actually. Thank you so much for a brilliant answer. I think those are three questions I probably wanted to ask. So having said that, I can toss the microphone to Mihan Kim. Um, thank you so much. It was lovely to hear you. Thanks. Thanks so much for your input. And uh, let's turn to Ms. Mihan Kim. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you so much, Bambo and Gyeongmiri, for like that interesting discussion. Thank you. Uh, some of the questions I had that Gyeongmi already less asked to her. So I have a question about the education about the teacher. So you said that it's important that education and school have to embrace the new knowledge and to personalizing learning. So you said education and school should know data science and social science like that. So uh, I was wondering that how can teacher and school, how can educate to could get knowledge of the data science and social science and anything else because we already know that it's important that education educator should know uh, everything about that but I think it's kind of the hard to the teacher knows everything about the social issue and science like that so my question was like the how should we deal about it we did how should can you say, repeat that question? I'm not sure that I got it. I am sorry. Uh, how should we teach what? How should how should teachers learn like that social science and data science like that? Because oh. yeah. well, what we actually we actually have faculty who use AI in their teaching so that the students first get to experience the AI and what it can do for them. And then we also develop curricula that the teachers can use in the classroom. So we actually, not only through our teaching do we use it, but we develop curricula and experiences that draw on AI as a tool. And that's what we are doing so that there are ready-made tools that teachers can use uh, in their classrooms and where you know and how they can learn science so for example you know to really engage students in in science and tech young students we have a virtual reality lab where the students can learn about bees you know the bees and they go into this virtual reality room and they can actually experience the flight of bees in the room so they can see how bees navigate in the flight and this is just a way to engage the students so that they get curious so that they can feel that it's real it's not just something that you memorize it's something that they can experience and feel part of so for us we are developing ways to really engage students that goes beyond, you know, in new ways, you know, like before you might've had labs that students did and science experiments, but now we can do things with virtual reality that tries to engage the interest and make them really understand and see the impact of their work. But the teachers themselves, we have a certificate so that if, if you wanna learn about AI, we have special certificate program that we offer so that a student can have a certificate in AI and learning or a certificate in data science so that they can get extra work in those areas. And these are areas of expertise that sets them apart from others. Yes, so extra work is important. Thank you. I, Professor Bembo, I uh, want to grab this chance to ask a question. And talking about your title, like dancing with AI, there's a hidden message that uh, we need to embrace it because you need to hold their hand first, then you can dance, right? So there's a hidden message that we need to embrace that uh, even if it is um, so many challenges and uh, difficulties. But I, I would like, like to know, um, what about the limitations of use um, AI 
such as uh, you talking about the ethical concerns about um, how to use it and how it can um, encourage students like a uh, creativity. Is it a stand in the way or can it be used like to foster students queer thinking or creativity? Can you share your thoughts about that? Thank you. Well, you know, absolutely. It can certainly challenge the creativity. I think that, you know, I think the issues come in uh, with, you know, if, it, if you're a student, how, you know, how much can you ask AI to do your work for you? Or, yeah. you know, are you using it as a tool to help you learn uh, more deeply or better? Or are you using it as a way to complete your your assignments and turn it in and pretend you did the work. So I think the, what what we're struggling with here is is to what extent can if you are writing, for example, a a a paper on a topic, how much can you use AI and mm -hmm. for that paper? How much do you give and what do you have to acknowledge that you did? When is it your work versus AI's work? So I think these are all the questions that our faculty are dealing with. Some of our faculty says, this is how and when you can use AI. And these are, or some faculty say you cannot use AI. Uh, but how do we credit that work so that we are not presenting work? When is it that it becomes our work versus when is it just the work of AI? And so to me, that's the challenge that we have is to, is to certainly embrace AI, but also to make sure that we do original work, that it actually stimulates the creativity and helps people go more deeply and go further rather than, well, now I can just, because I could just type into chat, you know, into the chat GPT, write a report mm -hmm. and it will write a report and you could turn that in but is that appropriate yes and i asked this question because i'm facing challenges when i conduct my research because i'm doing critical thinking assessment so you know when it comes to the um, primary students if they um, uh, allow to use ChatGPT 4.0, and then they just copy my question to the dialogue and they will get the answer directly. So there's no chance for the teacher. So hold on, uh, you can't, you know, cannot use that answer, but for higher education for maybe the uh, adolescents and they can um, be aware that how, what the harm, uh, it is harmful for them to use it like uh, totally to, do uh, the it, home. Is, it yes. is I mean I think um yes you can always answer it but you know you can always you have to actually evaluate what AI does if AI can provide a review or do something but you have to evaluate the answers is it correct right. is but they it didn't always go right <laughs> yes, <laughs> always. You know, it, it depends. Sometimes AI isn't correct, you know, or isn't doesn't fit the context. So maybe we have to teach differently about how do we evaluate the content that comes from AI? How do we know if it's all right? How do you know that it picked the right sources? How do you know that, you know, there's a lot of things. Yes, it can write something, but is does it really represent what we know today? Is mm -hmm. it accurate? How do you evaluate that? How do you evaluate it? Instead of saying we can't use the tool because you know what? Students are going to use it. They're going yeah. to use it. So mm -hmm. how do we then assume that they will and teach them the skills to use it appropriately and to take their learning to a higher level? That's where I think instead of making teaching, repeating, memorizing and repeating, now we can do problem solving. Now we can do critical thinking because you know before you had to memorize all these things, but who needs to do that? Because you can go into Google or you can go into 
AI, right. they, no, those, you don't have to do that because that information is at your fingertips. But how do you pull it all together? How do you evaluate? How do you critically think? I think those are the, and problem solving. And those are the skills we need to be teaching kids today much more than what are the capitals of the various countries of the world. Well, right. So we can figure that out very, very quickly. But uh, to evaluate, so we ought to be teaching in a different way. Okay, thank you. I think Professor Lee has uh, more questions. Yeah, it's a question from my student. Is it okay to ask yes. a question? Yes, it's from Chung Min uh, from SNU. Um, so uh, he's wondering actually that how Vanderbilt and and given the U U.S. like it's like part of the AI industry in terms of ad tech. So he was wondering how Vanderbilt and um, is doing in terms of making collaborative relationship between ad tech industry, which has their own interest in making a lot of money out of this practice and the policymakers having quite control upon teacher education practice and the hiring recruitment system and also educators like ourselves who is or a teacher educator who is actually in the field teaching students helping students so do you have any kind of I don't know strategy or synergy or vision that how the three sectors having their own interest very different from each other's can work together towards the better future well, we have to work together. I remember when they let when they introduced ChatGPT, and then several months later, the leaders of those companies said, "Oh, we're not ready for it. You're not supposed to use it." I got very frustrated because I thought, "Well, if 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 society is not ready for it, why did you release it in the first place? To release it and then ask us to say, "Oh, don't use it," you know that. <laughs> That seems that seemed pretty unfair to me. Um, so we are, you know, so those are the questions that are we are actually working and having industry partnerships, working with industry, working with policymakers, so that we can take and what we know, we can look at what industry needs, use AI as a partner. So in a way what we're thinking is that AI is a partner in our learning, is a partner in our research, and it's a partner in it. It's one partner. You are a partner, the industry is a partner, but we are certainly working with industry to uh, to use AI. Uh, you know, uh, for example, uh, we, you can look at, go back and look at, uh, uh, manuscripts all manuscripts and they can search manuscripts we're looking at ai and how you can use that to alleviate traffic problems because you know you can look at traffic and how can you design you know you know how can you organize the way vehicles drive in order to solve traffic problems there are just lots of ways to identify use ai as a tool to address social issues or commercial industry issues uh, so, you know, a doctor, for example, can use AI to have better diagnoses. So the medical profession, they can use AI. It's a tool. It, you know, the, the doctor has to evaluate what AI does, but it helps them consider more possibilities than they would otherwise. But definitely we are working with industry. We have Nissan here in, you know, in Tennessee. So we are partnering with Nissan and other companies here to see how we can work together to modernize the, set, the workforce. Thank you so much. Uh, by the way, Alice, I just want to point out there's a question from the Q&A. Yes. I think uh, the person is asking about the system of teacher education, which is another question coming from my class as well. So do you want to make yes. sure that the question is being asked? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor. And Professor Bembo, we have a um, question from the audience, and he is asking, in response to today's wave of artificial intelligence that you mentioned, how do you think schools of education should adapt in terms of educator training and curriculum to ensure that students are able to adapt to this field while realizing their potential? 
that's where that's why we are offering now courses in artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and also offering them certificates. And a certificate is really you earn that after you've taken three courses in that area. So the, it's not only that our teachers in their classes are using AI and asking students to use AI as part of their assignments, we are actually also giving them certificates that, that verifies that they do have some expertise in AI. Or the same thing in data science. How do you work with big data? Because that's another important factor. It's AI and data science work together. Those are big, those are big important issues. Okay, any more questions from the audience, from the floor? Ms. Kim? I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I think it is very good chance for us, uh, especially students, to uh, listen to Professor Bembo, uh, like working as a dean for like 26 years. And uh, wait, um, you, you did your PhD before I, I was born. <laughs> so, <laughs> so instead of lean on artificial intelligence, uh, totally, I think we still need the more knowledgeable others like Professor Bembo to talk about this issue and also share the uh, research um, ex expertise and also your experiences in doing some practices and uh, in this field. I think um, including like mathematically uh, gifted students and also working class students and also from the kindergarten students to our um, adolescents like um, we, we are talking lifelong learning now, right? So everybody needs to learn to embrace artificial intelligence. And also uh, we are also need to be aware of the challenges and also some harm for use of using AI in academic or so in the working space. And I think, I hope everyone gets some takeaway message now. And do you still have some takeaway message for everyone here? Professor Pimple. I'm sorry, Alice. Can I just sorry, can I just ask very last personal question though? Okay. I just don't want to let her go. I would <laughs> ask this question. Apparently in my classroom there's like more than a half of the um female students here and all we're all striving to be educational leader in the future. And it's just amazing how you have done that for 26 years as like female dean. So uh yeah, I know. I know it's not just a career session or anything, but I just want you to say some some of the important message of the takeaway that how we um, as a one particular group in the society can, you know, do the leadership as you have done. Okay. That would be lovely to hear. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's you know. Uh, the times change, and one I think AI, and you know, I've been a leader, you know, a dean at Vanderbilt for twenty six years. I was a dean for two years before that, so I've been deaning for twenty eight years. It's a long time, and you know what? The job always changes, and there's always something that changes, and you have to be flexible, and you have to just embrace change. And but you know. The best thing is to always, you know, to seek answers and always be open to the fact that, you know, you may not know everything and lean on others to help you be better. Because in the end, uh, leadership is really a team sport. You work with a lot of different people who can help you along. So for me, I think that as I look at education over these 28 years, it has changed tremendously. Uh, but you know what? One thing that hasn't changed, it's about people working together to create a better society and help students thrive. But the issues and the problems always change. But you know what? That's what a dean is. It's a problem solver. That's what we do. It's just to problem solve and hopefully come up with good solutions that serve all our students well. So I think of a dean and I, that's why 
I've enjoyed it is that the problems that you face are always changing. There's nothing that you do every day that's the same. Uh, and it always challenges you to think. And just like AI is now challenging us, it's another thing to adjust to and learn with. So you have to realize that when I started off as a student, we had typewriters. We did not have computers. <laughs> we, you know, so uh, the world has changed a lot <laughs> in this time. So if you can imagine having a typewriter and a calculator that only added and subtracted, divided and multiplied, and those are the tools that we had. <laughs> so we've come a long way <laughs> in those times. And you always just, instead of resisting the change, embrace it and figure out a way to make it yours and how it fits you. So don't fight change. Go along, you know, go with it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think the time is up and uh, thank you everyone for your participation and uh, and for your uh, time. I think you enjoyed um, talking with um, Professor Bembo and also our two esteemed uh, researchers in um, the Seoul uh, University. And thank you all. And I think um, please stay tuned. We have more Dean's Forum coming and good day and see you in the near, very near future. Thank you all. Bye.